Welcome to another edition of Rick and Bubba University, the podcast. And, you know, this is something you're going to start uh, seeing and hearing us do more. If we get on certain narratives that really seem to be interesting you, um, uh, you're interested in it, and then we want to come back and do maybe a part two or a part three kind of a series, well, obviously the worldwide pandemic and all the things we're discovering about COVID-19 and, and uh, w- there's just so much coming in, Bubba, that we, we decided uh, to have uh, Dr. Jordan Vaughn back with us again, and then we'll, we won't go back and repeat the stuff we, we already talked to him about on a Rick and Bubba University podcast that you can find in our archives, but we'll, we'll kind of focus today on long COVID and spike protein injuries and the blood clot. So uh, Dr. Jordan Vaughn, is, uh, he, he has um, uh, you know, med help clinics. They are in six locations. Uh, he sees over 180,000 patients a year, employs 20 physicians, over 200 healthcare workers, uh, and has been all over the world uh, talking to other scientists, uh, studying, you know, viruses and and, and studying the, the, you know what what has actually happened. He's got a BS in chemical engineering from the University of Alabama, medical degree from UAB School of Medicine, and completed his residency uh, in internal medicine at UAB Hospital. So uh, so he is here with us again. So welcome back to Rick and Bubba University, Dr. Vaughn. Thanks for having me back. Dr. Vaughn, thank you for being here. And and we kind of want to pick up this story where we left off last time. Right. We covered a lot of COVID stuff. But tell me, right or wrong, there is a perception that we're having a lot of people having issues with blood clots right now. And, and I know blood clots existed before COVID, but are we seeing an increase or are we just hearing about it more? So, so we are. I mean, it, it, again, and a lot of the blood clots that we talk about are not um, necessarily the macro thrombosis or the right. big vessel things. A lot of the, what we're seeing is that, um, especially when we talk about long COVID or persistent symptoms of COVID after the acute infection, uh, many of them can be boiled down to what we would call small vessel or microvascular, small vessel uh, issues. And uh, that's really, uh, it's kind of like a blood clot. I'd say a lot of times when I talk to patients about them having microclots or something like that, micro right. by definition, they'll go back to another doctor. The doctor will do a big scan and they'll say, well, you don't have clots. Well, again, they don't have macro clots, meaning right, like clots right. that we usually see. Um, but that that's really what is kind of, Again, those small clots, obviously, over time can, can lead to big clots. And so a lot of what we're seeing is some of that stuff. We're seeing a lot. Actually, the data out of England shows that they're having a lot more heart attacks as well as strokes. They keep better data over there because it's kind of a nationalized health system. Not that I'm in favor of that, but it's a good way to keep track of a lot of stuff. Sure, sure. And so a lot of things like what we would call minocus, which is like a minimal evidence of coronary disease. So somebody who has a heart attack in England that has an ST elevation MI, like a big, massive heart attack over there, they actually, um, if they don't have a history of coronary disease or heart disease, and they have this, they would usually do a, a kind of an autopsy and actually find out what, what went on. Well, mm-hmm. the evidence of usually those people having heart attacks without a history of heart disease used to be under 3%, mm-hmm. and now it's about 30%. Wow. So again, you're talking about all of a sudden this huge um, increase, and it's just a again, goes along with the fact that there has been something going on for the last three years, and it's, for the most part, having a detriment to, to the vascular system. So, And I, you're talking about spike proteins and all that, that are part of this. It, correct me, and I, I'm, I'm trying to keep politics out of this, but just strictly look at the science. But COVID can cause that, and correct me if I'm wrong, but also the vaccine could cause that, either or or both, right? Yeah, exactly. So uh, the people I work with, uh, Risha Pretorius out of South Africa and Doug Kell out of the University of Liverpool, one of their kind of seminal works was to prove that you take platelet-poor plasma, which is a basically funny way of saying this part of your blood, mm-hmm. and you drop in the spike protein. And we're not talking you know, independent of infection or the vaccine. It starts to make this aggregation of fibrin. And I usually use the description of imagine God made us to make fibrin. Okay. Fibrin usually kind of looks like spaghetti that comes out Mm -hmm. of the colander that you can kind of pull apart. But this looks like burnt spaghetti that has cheese in it that you got to get a Brillo pad out to Mm -hmm. get it off the surface. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 And that that was kind of what I was going to ask you because I've I've seen some published stories and, and it's so dramatic. You think, can that even be real? 
where they're claiming that these type clots that you're talking about, they actually show some of them from autopsies or from, uh, 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 you know, various things that were done to folks after death, you know, embalming, whatever. But I guess it mostly would be autopsy, but it literally it doesn't look like a blood clot, but it looks like a, a mess of something in there. Is that is that real? It, yeah, so it, it, you're talking a little bit about on the autopsy side, or, and where we would say on the embalming side. And the embalming side, it definitely, there's definitely something, again, I'm not involved in that, but uh, there's definitely something going on when they embalm that a lot of uh, basically funeral homes are seeing that's abnormal. It's different. They hadn't seen it before. Um, but I will tell you on the autopsy side that when we look at people that had COVID or have um, a history of injury from COVID, or the vaccine itself, when they do uh, autopsies on their tissues, their tissues, uh, for the most part, have a lot of microthrombi or fibrin aggregates in the small vessels. Mm -hmm. And that that's pretty important. And again, I'll go back to, I kind of used this metaphor last time. Um, you know, a lot of people, it's like they're standing in their shower uh, and nothing's coming out of the shower head, okay? So they call the plumber uh, and the plumber comes to their house and stays out in the yard and tells them their eight inch water mains open is open. Right. And the problem with that is, is that's kind of where medicine is. Medicine's still out in the yard. When you mm -hmm. go and get evaluated, what we're really telling you for the most part is that your big vessels are open, right. but guess where oxygen and a lot of things are delivered. Right. The it, tiny vessels. The tiny vessels. Yeah. Right. Almost where red blood cells line up in a row. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and when that is compromised it can cause significant dysfunction on every level. So, yeah, so let's talk about like cases that I'm familiar with. We're not going to talk about the patients' names or anything like that. But what they're describing, and you can help us here, the the friend of mine that is has sought your help, and I'm going to say who it is. But um, he said he was he never took the vaccine, but he did have COVID, and I think he might have had it more than once. I'm not sure, but he said his symptoms were, and, and see if you can help because that's one of the emails I got. Can you talk to him about symptoms? He said, I just felt lethargic. I couldn't get any energy. And he's in great shape. He works very hard at the job he has. He's very active, works out every week, multiple times. And he said, I just started losing. I, I just felt fatigued all the time. And so is that one of the things you should look for, whether you're getting it from you had COVID or you've had one of the vaccines? Is this what I'm looking for? Is that the main symptom? Exactly. And I would say, so again, if your tissues aren't getting oxygen, you're going to feel like yeah. pretty, pretty bad. Right. Um, and so what you got to understand is, is that a lot of, a lot of, a lot of people don't, you know, medicine's really good at siloing things out there. But when you talk about just an overwhelming sense of fatigue and actually the most important concept is something called post-exertional malaise. And basically that means a lot of these people are pretty fit to begin with. And then they try to do the things that they used to be mm -hmm. able to do. And not only do they feel poorly, but 24 hours later, they feel even worse. Okay. And what what's going on there for the most part is instead of when we were exercising when we were young, we our vessels would dilate, get more oxygen, or even we would push a little bit and get a little lactic acid. We're going because we'd be anaerobic where we're doing intervals. But our body would recover, and it would recover because it would get the oxygen back, and it would actually then actually break down a little bit and actually build more muscle. Um, that's not happening. Instead – the blood is being totally, we call it ischemic, um, meaning it, it's not even getting there. And so the tissues are basically going into what we call cell death kinetics, meaning where they're pushing out reactive oxygen species and lactic acid and just air, all this stuff. They're starving to death. Exactly. And so you're basically, you know, strangling them. And then actually when, and Doug Kell, who I work with at University of Liverpool, he's described it as like a reperfusion injury. One of the reasons we don't give blood back immediately to somebody who's had a stroke or a big heart attack is because sometimes that can do damage too. We reperfuse too quickly. And so then 24 hours later, they've reperfused and they feel even worse. And so that is one of the classic examples of kind of post-exertional malaise. And it's a good example that there's dysfunction everywhere. And that would go to you know, cognitive dysfunction. I mean, right. again, I usually tell, tell people, it's kind of like, imagine taking you to about 25,000 feet and just saying, oh, no acclimation, go ahead and take a test and run a mile. And that also explains that COVID haze you hear about. I got brain fog and, exactly. and, and all that. So, And if they just do the normal stuff out in the yard, talking about your plumbing, they'll look at your, your big vessels and go, well, you, you seem fine to us. It must just be long COVID. And what you're able to find is these tiny yeah. little clots that, are, that, are, that, are, that, are, that almost has the, the blood's not flowing 
the way it's supposed to because it's it's almost turned into a yeah. A, well, it, it's it, on the interstate. It's just not in the neighborhood. Well, right. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 it's called. I would call it sludge. I actually like right. the word yeah. sludge yeah. better. Okay. But uh, imagine, yeah, the small pipes. And again, your red blood cells are where oxygen actually gets the mo- most bang for the buck. But you're, you actually have oxygen dissolved in the rest of your blood. But if the red blood cells can't get to the tissue and only oxygen that's dissolved in the blood can get to the tissue, that ain't enough oxygen to especially exercise and do things or even use your brain in an executive cognitive way, meaning like high, higher level, high functioning. So a lot of people, memory, um, sitting down and doing tasks that require more than just regular attention. And so a lot of people, they're very, the symptoms are um, just they're hard for a physician in general because most of us are very siloed in what we know. Yeah. Um, they're hard to kind of put together. And I, I always go back to the fact that a lot of people will be sent to four different specialists and might come away with four different new chronic diagnoses. Mm-hmm. And I usually ask the question, is it more likely that this guy just has four brand new chronic diagnoses <laughs> or is it more likely that the That's disease he just had right. was is going to cause all the symptoms. And the reality is that's why I got hooked up with Doug and Risha is because when they started putting stuff out in the literature that it really explained this thing, it made the most sense to what my patients were seeing. So I reached out to them. And since then we've been, you know, just doing a lot of stuff together. The more interesting thing, and this may be, um, you know, related is that they're also, when we talk about sludge, especially in the white and Asian population, there's an issue we have. That's a very common genetic a polymorphism or something you're born with that makes your ability to break this junk down pretty difficult to begin with. And we call it plasminogen activator inhibitor one and something that I test for. And about 90% of these people I'm about to publish it with Doug, uh, have this genetic issue. So again, it's uh, you, you sit there and say, well, why my friend here looks exactly like this guy. In fact, that guy's healthier. That right. guy runs 10 miles okay. away. And he's having more trouble. And he's having more trouble. And it comes down to that they pick the wrong parents. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we'll come back. We'll talk more with Dr. Jordan Vaughn when Rick and Bubba University, the podcast, continues. This is the Rick and Bubba Show. Watch more at blazetv.com slash Rick and Bubba. Rick and Bubba, Rick and Bubba. All right, so Bubba, really, on average, at least at least three, three, four times a month, we get emails from people going, "Loving my Raycons. I'm loving the Raycon uh, earbuds." And there's a reason for that. Uh, number one, uh, you probably thought when you paid about half the price of the other premium audio brands, they weren't going to sound as good. All right. And then you've paid about and half. You were shocked. Yeah, and they sound fantastic. So you're loving that. And you're also loving, the, you know, the different sound profiles. You can set that based on what you're going to be listening to. Like this podcast would be one profile. If you're going to crank up the funk, that'd be a different profile, and right. and, and so on. Uh, and you can do that. And then you have the awareness mode. Uh, if you need to hear what's going on around you, you go awareness. If you want to isolate yourself, uh, you're listening to something. You know, maybe you're, maybe it's time for you to do your devotion. Maybe it's time for you to, you know, listen to uh, this podcast, and you don't want there to be distractions around you. You would go to that mode. Uh, so uh, there's all kinds of different ways to customize them, including their comfort. Their gel tips are perfect. The most comfortable ear fit you will ever have, and they will not budge if you're trying to work out, do a little better. Uh, They stay where they are. So get yours now, and we're going to get you an additional 15% off. And uh, so we're going to try to make this as easy as we can for you uh, to get some more. So go to uh, buyraycon.com. Go to buyraycon.com, and then you want to put in our code, Rick Bubba, okay? Buyraycon.com with the code Rick Bubba and save an additional 15% on your Raycon earbuds. All right, so Dr. Jordan Vaughn is our guest. Uh, he's back on Rick and Bubba University. We're, we're focusing today uh, on this blood clot phenomenon that we're seeing uh, and, um, and, and the fact that you are developing treatments uh, for, from something that's getting missed. Now, first of all, tell us how you test for it. Uh, because I, uh, the the people that I know that have already come to see you, uh, you've actually shown them. Here's what I see in the blood, and this is explaining what's wrong with you. And then what really makes them excited is you you can help them with it. So so tell us how you test for it. Yes. Yeah, so so uh, interestingly enough, again going back to knowing Doug Kell and Risha, Risha uh, for the last probably 20 years has kind of been one of the world experts in coagulation, and she's has a, a fancy lab down in South Africa, and basically. 
Um, she was the one that originally put out the papers that showed you could see this in the plasma. Um, and me being who I am, <laughs> I decided to say, okay, that makes a lot of sense. And then the next thing I know, I'm buying a microscope and getting Risha to train me to do it. So that's really what I'm able to do, which is pretty awesome because uh, she's come over. She trained uh, NYU, a guy, there's a lab in uh, NYU, Petrino Lab. And then she trained Yale and she trained Harvard. And then she decided to train little old me down in Birmingham. <laughs> so, um, so it's really cool because, it, it, you know, again, I was treating people based on symptoms and a lot of other. I had some surrogates that I was finding in the blood that are useful and we're still working on them, you know, multiple surrogates because not everybody can get a, a, a microscope. One of the things that I like about that lab I just told you all about, plasma yeah. inactivator inhibitor one, is it's, it's a pretty good indicator that something's going on if they have that issue. Um, but it's, it's nice to be able to prove to these patients there's something abnormal. First of all, because a lot of times they've been through, uh, you know, tons of doctors who have said, Again, everything out in the yard is fine. Right. And uh, this is a way to actually get in the house and see what the pipes inside the house look like. And that's really what we do. I basically get your blood. We spin it down. We stain it for something that's immunofluorescent. And immunofluorescence means that it kind of lights up without, you know, regular mm -hmm. a visible spectrum. And uh, that shouldn't happen, meaning the fact that it lights up means that it's in that amyloid, that bad spaghetti. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's that it's the... Not the spaghetti you can pull apart, but this yeah, the cheese spaghetti. Yes, yeah, cheese spaghetti that's burnt. You know, uh, it's nasty. It is, uh, and we've been told a term, and I, I can't think of it uh, right offhand. Uh, uh, a test that you you get for blood clots. D. Yeah. So, what is it? So D dimer is D dimer. So when it. we talk about fibrin, which is what we're talking about, that abnormal spaghetti. There's good fibrin. The fibrin is that's good. Mm -hmm. Your body, God designed us to make fibrin to stop spreading of different. Uh, mm -hmm bacteria and viruses as well as stop people from bleeding um but if you but you need it broken down so right. if you make the bad spaghetti it's harder to break down um the d-dimer really tells you that there's breakdown happening mm -hmm. but in a lot of these people like people that have that plasminogen activator inhibitor issue that i'm talking about they can't they break can't it break down. it down right. so guess what d-dimer is a byproduct of fibrin breakdown so if fibrin can't be broken down do you think your d-dimer is going to be elevated it's not mm -hmm. and so that's the that's the the funny thing in medicine is you know, you got to know what the test means a lot of times, right. and I think uh, to see what you're looking at exactly. So, uh, it, is it, do, you, do you think these uh, micro clots? I'll just use that term. Is really what we're seeing for people who are suffering from what's being called long COVID? Yeah, and that that's basically what uh, Risha proved about 20 months ago was that 100 percent of her sample uh, had long, and it, it's 100 percent. Yeah. A hun 100% had them. And then the interesting thing is how we found it out. Now, Jaco, who's this cardiac intensivist in South Africa, uh, was taking care of patients in the ICU, doing exactly the opposite of what Fauci was telling everybody to do by using anticoagulants and not putting people on ventilators. Had about 400 people in his ICU in June of 2020 through that summer, only 16 deaths. But what he did was follow their blood because he mm -hmm. had Risha down the street and Risha was looking at the blood and right. saying, because he was like, this is the craziest coagulation parameters I've ever seen. Get, get your microscope over here. Let's look at the blood. Um, and from there, very few of those patients ever came back with long COVID. Almost none of them did. But then a lot of these people that weren't really sick, and that's one of the other things I'd like to say, you don't have to be sick for this to happen. Actually, the first athlete, the first people that I took care of were college athletes that didn't even know they had COVID other than... They were swabbed every day. Somebody told them that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But then two to three weeks after that, they their time started going, and the harder they worked, the worse they got. That right. was kind of my first signal. So you don't have to have it bad. But those who started showing up in, in Jocko's office, and he got Risa to look at their blood. And the interesting thing was is they had these microclots that were in the acute phase people that cleared when he used anticoagulants and, and antiplatelets. And so then that was the original study. To, let's try what I was doing in the acute phase and the long phase. And the study actually showed that these people improved. So, so go ahead. Well, yeah. I, I was going to ask you, because when you, you were talking about the, the blood thickening up like that, it, isn't that kind of the same uh, effect you get from a snake bite? Isn't that what it does? It thickens the blood up? Somewhat. That, it's, it, 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 this is just a very, am, it, the word we use is amyloid, but it's, it's just an abnormal folding mm -hmm. that the spike protein really causes. But it's not a, it's not, it, you could... I guess make it a, that argument a little bit, but it's 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 a bit different. When you're treating it, and and we want to talk more about that, it is is dilating the blood vessels. Is that one way you can treat it, or so, do you have to chemically try to dissolve that 
that uh, thickening. Yeah, so, so what we have found is that if you inhibit, so most of these little things exist in kind of a steady state, meaning they're both being broken down and repaired kind mm-hmm. of all the time. That's what a biological system mm-hmm. does. Right. And so if you inhibit the repair and production, you allow the body and force the body to break it down. Um, now, that forced us to also discover that other thing called plasminogen activator inhibitor one or pile one because there is some people that just cannot break this stuff down. And so then you have to push it the other way. So that's on the fibrinolytic side. It's a fancy word, but it basically means fibrin breakdown. And so there's other things you can use. There's lots of natural things that actually are in nature, like natokinase, seropeptase, uh, that uh, occur naturally that are good at breaking down fibrin. And then those are the things that we... What is that found in? So natokinase is actually in the Jap- it's a it's a soy-based food that the Japanese eat. It's probably one of the reasons the Japanese have less coronary and, and uh, strokes, uh, heart disease and strokes than, um, you know, other nations because right. it's a huge part of their diet. Serapeptase actually comes from the uh, digestive enzymes of the silkworm. Uh-huh. So the silkworm, to get out of its husk, has serapeptase in its stomach. The cool thing now is that we can get those bacteria, really is what produces them, out of those um, uh animals or uh living things and yeah. then actually make them right. make a bunch of it synthesize for. it in the laboratory yeah. exactly and so that's really what all these supplements are is they're just and yeah, we thought it was fish i know the time. it was it's actually the soy product oh, yeah right? yeah it, so dip the fish what they dip the fish in i guess <laughs> so questions that that we received we talked about you being on number one we've talked about that it can all this can occur from having covid mild or extreme cases you also talked in the last podcast, well, if I'm putting spike protein in your body for any reason, whether it's COVID or an mRNA vaccine, you can still have the same problem because the spike protein's coming in that way. Is that accurate? A hundred percent. Spike is a spike. Spike no is how a spike. you got it, right? Yeah. So then what they were asking is, number one, if I took the J&J, it did not use that technology. So where, did, where am I on J&J? I had one guy say, be sure you ask him that today. So luckily, the J&J only has one exposure. Right. It's an older method, meaning it uses an adenovector. It uses a virus that we've used historically. We probably have 30 years of data on it in terms of where it goes and what mm-hmm. it does. Um, but it's still the spike. And the problem with the spike is... So and, it and, is still. Yeah. And the problem with the spike is, is that the other thing that a lot of people don't realize is the spike kind of exists in this form of pre-confirmational or fusion form. And so... What these fancy guys at University of Pennsylvania did to make you have a better, better reaction to the spike when you get the vaccine is they inserted two prolines to make it harder for the body to break it down and push it into a conformational form. So that is one of the downsides to the mRNA vaccine is the spike is actually probably a, a it's an engineered spike. It's, mm-hmm. Yeah, no. but spike is spike. So they all have yeah. spike, including yeah. COVID has spike. Yeah. mRNA may be a more... Yeah. Difficult spike. Yeah, and especially and the boosters, can, as you said last time, the boosters, you're just it's stacking. It's a designer it. spike. Right? Yeah, this, the, yeah, the <laughs> boosters, you're just stacking them now, right? Yeah. And, and, yeah. and, and, and again, I mean, we know now that the, the available uh, infection in nature is not as thrombogenic, meaning it's, it's not as clot-provoking. Yet the vaccine still has the original strand. And so that, that again, should beg the question. So it actually mutated in, in a good direction as far as this is concerned, but the vaccine holds you back to the very beginning. Exactly. And so that, to me, that, that makes it where the thrombogenic risk of the vaccine are now probably worse than the actual infection itself. All right, let's come back. We'll continue. Well, that Dr. Was, Jordan. That's, that's, that's fresh word. Right yeah, that's, well, huh? that was where I was getting to, and, yep. and you got there. Uh, Dr. Jordan Bond is our guest. We'll talk more when Rick and Bubba University, the podcast continues. All right, so Bubba, you you just turn on news, you open up Twitter, and you just look around, and my goodness. One thing is blatantly obvious. The world is in desperate need, we talk about this on the show all the time, of God-fearing men. Uh, Men must not give up meeting together and encouraging one another toward love and good deeds. And as we know, right now, our society is screaming, men are not the answer to anything, they're the problem. And, uh, and that could not be more of a 180 in the wrong direction. It's always been true. Men have always had an influence that cannot be replaced by anyone else in society. 
Uh, it's never been truer than it is right now. And the word is full. The world right now, we got cynicism and darkness, and uh, godly men still need to stand together in fellowship and prayer. And that's why we want to point you to our brother Jason Whitlock. Uh, He's organizing Fearless Army Roll Call. I love this. It's an all-day event to encourage men to put on the full armor of God and take a stand against the evil forces destroying the American culture. Now, at this conference, you're going to hear speeches from Jason and several other special guests that will inspire you to be a better husband, father, witness for Christ. Roll Call will inspire, uplift, and even entertain you. So if you'd like to secure (laughs) yours right now, Get your seats by going to fearlessarmyrollcall.com. Fearlessarmyrollcall.com. Put all that together. Reserve your spot today and make sure you're there. Dr. Jordan Vaughn is our guest on this edition of Rick and Bubba University, the podcast. We're discussing uh, the spike protein uh, found in the vaccines and, yes, put in your body by actually being infected with COVID. He has uh, uh, been working to find treatments for those who are suffering from what we're calling long COVID, but it's really uh, all tied to your body reacting to the spike protein and causing these tiny blood clots to be, cause a sludge uh, in your blood. And and he is developing treatments for that. And I'm hearing from people that are already seeing you and your team and, and they're feeling better. The other question that we got was how far removed to either being affected, in, infected with COVID or you took one of these vaccines that you could say, I think I'm in the clear. I seem to be okay. Uh, is or do we even know that yet? I don't. I don't think we know that. But as um, you know, I would. I would say the the further away, the better. I mean, right, again, yeah. you just you just went over the fact that the current of it, you know, the current available um, infection in nature is right. you would much prefer getting this one than than the uh, the one that's out there right now exactly whatever well, it's called yeah again it's not i don't advise anybody get covid no but, but um what i'm saying is if if you were choosing it uh you would want that better than the wuhan and actually the weird thing was the delta was probably the one that was the most thrombogenic yeah um and so that that kind of lines up with where we really had the kind of craziness that we had that summer um but the uh you know to me it's the farther away the better and then the other thing a lot of people ask me is uh, I've had these symptoms for two years or three years. I mean, I have one patient that I took care of. Uh, it's actually a, his wife is a wife of a guy I went to med school with and his wife had, um, had this since March of 2020. Wow. And, uh, it, they'd been to Mayo clinic and Cleveland clinic, all these places. And again, didn't really get any answers. Um, and actually we got him, her on therapy and now she's back. She has five children and just taking care of her and getting her back to health, uh, was kind of incredible. And again, there's, there's a, Stories like that. I mean, I've done about 700 people, and I mean, there's amazing stories that just okay. breaks your heart to see. Yeah, but you're not saying to somebody that comes and said, I've been like this for two years, and you go, well, sorry, too bad. Exactly. Uh, yeah. so, so you're saying no matter how long you felt this way, these therapies could help. They could, yeah. yeah. And again, I think that's the important part about, first of all, having having the ability to diagnose it correctly, um, and then also have the expertise. And again, I think that's, again, when we go back to even last time we talked about it, it's like, we have a pharmacopoeia of things that are available to us that we know about, and we have a lot of data on how they work in people. Uh, they may work. We may be using them for a different thing than they're, you know, indicated for. But we are able to do that. It's called off label. It's half of what doctors do every day. So yeah, doctor, let me ask you this: um, for people listening to this who who may have had COVID, may not, may have had vaccine, may have not, they they think they're okay. Uh, maybe they are a little tired. I mean, we all are aging <laughs> yeah. every day, right? I mean, yeah. what is can they come and be tested for this, or what should they do? Should they wait till they have symptoms to be tested for this? Because I know a lot of people that just are so confused, and they've been told so many things that have been proven wrong. Oh yeah, they know they 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 you know they had COVID, and they would just like peace of mind. To put this to bed, can they get a test uh, or come to you, or how can they how can they resolve this in their world? So we're working on that. One of the things that I, I guess even we had a we had a big meeting uh, again. It's it's the uh, English and South African consortium. So the meeting starts at ten a.m. for me, which is kind of very convenient. <laughs> yes, it's afternoon. Um, sure. So we meet up, uh, but. Uh, we're, we're trying to get it where this is something that can be done pretty easily. Because even what I'm doing under the microscope with my eyes, um, we can actually, there's, there's actually the technology really to do it on 
more of a commercialized scale to see and then actually give you even how much like our goal is actually to get flow cytometry pretty soon to be able to tell you hey rick you have this much per deciliter of this let's see if we can get it down to this and mm -hmm. so again that's kind of the, how science progresses right but um right now uh you know a lot of it is just finding places like that that know how to do it um and that it's weird that it, it hasn't gone more wide stream uh, but it, it, it's getting there. I think the more that it accumulates, I think, uh, actually Risha and we were like, they've talked about us in national geographic a couple of weeks ago. I mean, it's, it's, so it's starting to be more cause I, it's going to be, and I think this frustrates us as people who just want to get well, we, we don't want politics and science, you know, we can't have that. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it, it, it's like now you go, well, if I, if I admit we had something wrong, well, we throughout our whole the whole time we've been, we believe created, but the whole time that we've been around, we've done things and went back and said, okay, we need to correct that. Now we have a better path or that was the wrong path. And now we're on the right path. That's science. We've done that. Well, that, if, But now it's almost like nobody can ever say, yeah, now we were wrong about that, but I, I think we're headed in the right direction here. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and, and, and I'll tell you, that's, a, that's the first thing that I think as a physician, I think is important is I got to care about the patient and curious what's wrong with them. Right. Um, and first thing, caring, meaning to me, I just care about getting people better. I really don't right. care about whatever, you know, for all I know, they probably could have been saying terrible things about me two years ago, but if they want to get better, let's get better. I mean, yeah, well, just like the one guy that I do know, he he thought, well, I guess I'm going to feel this way the rest of my life. Yeah. And now you're treating him and he's like, okay, so I can feel better? So I uh, mean, yeah, don't, I mean, don't, so, does anybody care about that? I so, mean, so a good story, again, I mean, the first people I did were college athletes that had objective evidence mm -hmm. that they mm -hmm. were declining. Actually, it was after a conference call I had with Rishan Doug and Jocko. Uh, I was sitting at my uh, parents' table and just talking to my dad. My dad's a physician about what I was doing. And my mom walks in and says, I think I have that. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and she's 71. Um a little then, tougher to, to yeah, to but she just thought she was getting older, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I don't, you know, again, people do get old. You sure, know, there's nothing wrong with that. But I mean, if you we see, lose the staff yeah, every day, yeah, yeah. but, but if, still, if you see an acute decline around the timing, yeah. you know, within two to six weeks of having either COVID or the vaccine, that's probably a pretty good indicator to say maybe maybe that's associated. I'm not saying it is. I'm just saying that would be. But where, you need to check into it. Yeah, that's what I. Yeah. So again, I, I mean, that, that's. Pretty sad that I'm sitting here doing all this crazy research, and my mom probably well, she did. I mean, she got better. You know, my my wife probably is not. I mean, she's back to her old self. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know. So um, you, you, you test you tested your mom. Yeah. yeah. Did she did she have some yeah. effects of this? Yeah, she did. Yeah. And uh, uh, the other interesting thing, and it's funny, my my father has uh, Parkinson's, and actually Risha's earlier stuff was lurk looking at how these amyloid fibrin these things that i see under the microscope accumulate in neurodegenerative diseases and this mm -hmm. was she probably published that 10 years ago and i was like dad man let's look at your blood you know because and his i mean again it was a different type of lighting up but it lit up like a parkinson's patient so right. again it can this this technology i think again getting inside the house and figuring out the piping in the, the system right. the small vessels i mean that's the silver lining of a lot of this is it could help us with all kinds of things when you talk about the things that are really we haven't solved in medicine. They are the small vessels. Yeah, I mean, you're you're really, if we can keep using this water pipe analogy, you're 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 trying to to find out who and why and how to get the lime off the spigot. Exactly. I, I, actually, <laughs> yeah. and a lot of these people that have this little genetic issue. I mean, um, you know, COVID kind of exposed it. Yeah. But it doesn't mean we don't need to keep their pipes clean. Right. Meaning for the future. Meaning because they're all that. What I would say is we treat for long COVID, and then let's risk modify. Let's Let's decrease your risk. Right. Let's let's keep your pipes clean. Yeah, yeah. The the blood is the answer. I mean, you can't you can't live with it, and everything has to have it. Sure. So. Uh, uh, we'll come back. We'll finish up with Dr. Jordan Vaughn on this edition of Rick and Bubba University, the podcast. All right. So none of us like the idea of supporting companies that uh, we would be opposed to these platforms, and they're 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 chasing all these different woke agendas, and and a lot of it's not even sincere. They're they're patronizing at best many times. But you think to yourself, well, I got to do it. I don't have any choice. Well, let me tell you right now, Patriot Mobile has given you a choice. Uh, Patriot Mobile now offers service with all the three major networks. This means if you're with the big three and you love their service but you hate their values, you can access that same service, but do it through Patriot Mobile. 
Uh, they also offer performance guarantee. If you're not happy with the coverage, you can switch between the three major carriers, and they'll handle that for you for free. So they're the only Christian conservative wireless provider offering nationwide coverage on the best 4G and 5G networks so you get the same great service while supporting a company that fights to preserve uh, our God-given rights and freedoms. So why don't you stop doing that? Go ahead and make the move. Just go to patriotmobile.com slash Rick Bubba. Put our names together. Patriotmobile.com slash Rick Bubba. Or you can call them at 878-PATRIOT. Yes, you do have a choice. Dr. Jordan Vaughn is our guest on this edition of Rick and Bubba University, the podcast. Uh, he's visiting with us again. We're following up on what we're finding out because, let's face it, we've been through a worldwide pandemic. We all know somebody uh, that has either had COVID, uh, they've had the vaccines. We're trying to figure this out, that out. Uh, you know, what are some of the side effects from both? Uh, and he is on the cutting edge with scientists around the world researching treatments for people who struggle with what, you know, some people call it long COVID. Right. Others say this is a side effect from the vaccine, um, and, and you can be tested to find out if if they can address it, and if they can, there's treatments um, that are available and continuing uh, to be researched. So we're, we're, try- we're covering that mainly on this stop by. Dr. Vaughn, let, let me ask you this uh, uh, case study. I uh, have a friend, had COVID, got over it. It was a very light case, no problem. Got it again about a year later has not been able to get over it. He didn't have debilitating symptoms when he had it, but he seems to be in this long COVID mode. So. Can't get rid of this, can't get rid of that, feels terrible. Hey, I just can't seem to beat it. Does having it multiple times, does that increase your chances of, of something like with these microclots? Yeah, so, it, I mean, there's no no question there's a cumulative aspect to it. And so, again, um, it goes back to that, is my factory able to break these things down correctly? Right. And I always say it's imagine that if, a lot of these people, especially with the genetic issue, especially have their factory doesn't work well. Their factory to break down fibrin doesn't right. work well. And every time a thousand truckloads of poorly packed fibrin show up to their factory, They're their factory trouble. still don't work well. Yeah. Does that make sense? Backed up. It's a messed up yeah. factory. Yeah. And so, so the problem is you got to optimize the factory, but you probably don't want as many truckloads showing up either. And right. so how I'd say is, yes, I mean, it's a cumulative effect that, um, and a lot of people, uh, even, you know, a good evidence that, you know, that they might even have that is, is, is that after the second or third time that they start to go, you know, I, I, I really haven't recovered from this in the same way. And I think, again, it, it doesn't make sense because I just told you that the thrombogenic thrombogenicity of this is not as bad, but it makes sense from a cumulative aspect. It's, it's, it seems to be at the point that you get those, I mean, if you have a sludged pipe, you know, it's it, there's at one point that that sludge pipe starts, you know, squeak it. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it may not be, you know, the same amount for everybody, but once once it gets to where it can't get those red blood cells through, I think that's when you get symptoms. All right. I know we've asked you this, but I have to ask it again because it seems like we were wrapping up and we talk, brought this up. Are, are, do you know anybody that's doing the research on these people, Bubba's son's one, my wife's one, they have been living around this for three years. They never get it. They get exposed to it. My wife's been exposed to it multiple times. She never gets it. She never tests positive. She's never had one problem with it. What is the deal with these people? Yeah, I, I don't know that we have great research into that, but I have plenty of patients like that as well. That I What's mean, the deal? I, yeah, I, 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 there's, there's, again, going back to, you know, the same thing with when right. we talk about who gets long COVID, 90, right. 90% of these people seem to have this issue with fibrin breakdown. There's got to be a genetic. Something. There, 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 there has to be. And that. We just and we kind of ruled out the blood type thing. That didn't stand. Did yeah. I mean, we just kind of have it under they, they have a good immune system, at least it, for this. It, but but it, it almost seems like there's something else. I think there, yeah, I think there is. Where they're able to make better mucosal immunity where they, you know, can actually, you know, fight it. I, I will tell you that one of the guys that, um. Uh, I work with as uh, he's a radiologist out of Salisbury in England. His name is Graham Lloyd Jones, and he's actually kind of defined what we call orosystemic health, which is why the mouth is so important in terms of how you get infected. And actually, your dentition and your uh, you know your oral health really predicted how bad you got COVID. Again, in England, of course, they look into that. Um, All right. <laughs> but uh, the um, but interestingly enough, he just published a paper talking about something called CPC mouthwash, which you can look it up. But CPC mouthwash actually 
uh, they started giving it to their patients in Salisbury Hospital, and it reduced the time uh, that they were in the hospital by about four days. Um, and so there is, it, it, he kind of, is, he's almost, I think the other paper's coming out, but he's kind of proved that the mouth is the factory for this SARS-CoV-2 spike, meaning like the, the virus just, and it really does matter what your dentition is. Um, and then that really leads to how quickly it gets into your lungs. Because again, guess what your mouth is connected to? Through, right. Just through yeah. your heart. So um, it's a, so again, uh, it could be great, great oral health, you know, for all. Surely and, and we know that affects hearts. I mean, yeah. we've oh, yeah. covered oh, yeah. that with Absolutely. the dentist we've had on before. Yeah. Uh, it, it's amazing the tie in between dental health yeah. and heart issues sometimes. Yeah. And I guess it would be hard to group them together because it could possibly be you pull, put somebody in the group and they had it. They just didn't know they had it. Yeah. It'd be hard to identify. You really haven't had it. I mean, I know with my wife, she's had her antibodies tested. Yeah, the antibodies are the best way to test yeah, it. And, yeah, and they, it's never shown that she's ever had it. And But but again, I mean, yeah. with, with T-cells and stuff like that, could it not show up in that and her still have had it? Probably not. Yeah, so if I you've mean, had it, it should show it up. It should show up. Okay, yeah. Um, but but, we, you know, but I'd love to get a bunch of those together and let's research them and find some link I, but but again, it could go back to something like genetics. It may not well. Be. I, I know we've had that issue, and the subject of blood types have been brought up before. Yeah, and he, he said that kind of didn't pan out. Yeah, and yeah. I know there's been uh, uh, diets in the past that dealt with different type blood types. Yeah, are, are they really that much different uh, biologically in blood types, or is it just the mix? Yeah, it, it. I mean, it, it matters a, a big deal when we're talking about right. transfusion. Oh, sure. In terms, right, of, right. Uh, sure. in terms of that, I mean, there, there's, again, I mean, you could, you know, massage data and look at all that kind of stuff for a long time and come up with some kind of, you know, outcome. Yeah. But um, it's it's not in the clinic. We rarely take take it into account. So, so with just a few minutes left, we, we really, our mind is boggled on the show on the obsession with the vaccine. Yeah. I mean, you can look at an obvious thing and say, well, it's money making and all that, but it just feels, you know, like with this thing about, you know, we, this, the tennis player that can't come in and play uh, because he won't take the vaccine. But yet, those of us that live here who also haven't taken the vaccine go travel and come back. And then if you have the vaccine, you can still catch it and pass it. I, I don't understand the obsession with the vaccine still going because it seems like I don't have a problem that we tried it. Okay, I do have a problem that we kind of rushed it, and then we, we get we. It, it appears that the the origin of it, we got kind of duped on that, which I don't think any of us really believed that. Well, it's because uh, cars yeah. have steering wheels, right, right. Sometimes you have to correct course, and right, we yeah. can't figure out why we're not turning the giant steering yeah, wheel yeah. Yeah. of science and medicine. Right I want to know what good, and <laughs> and I know this is going to upset some people, and you can distance yourself from me if you want to. What good is getting the vaccine now? There's really not good data on it doing anything um there's plenty of data on it causing um correct some significant issues it's not uh, worth the risk yeah, anymore and, in my and, opinion but but the data since really the uh, especially the bivalent vaccine uh that you know if you want to know how poorly the vaccine was uh tested in its onig- original iteration just wait until you look how the booster was done no <laughs> if yeah. that makes sense i mean it's it's we're just adding bad information upon bad information and i think um I really think we need our public health officials as well as just the people to demand that we correct course back to what would be regular approval. Yeah, isn't it? uh, I mean, it's amazing to me, too, still, even at this point, because people are not filling hospitals with it and we're we're not in that mode. Thank goodness. But we're now wanting to give it to kids. Oh, come on. And we just I mean, come on, man, their their risk of significant injury or death. The numbers were minuscule. Yeah. I mean, you, you just you had to go out so many points past the, the decimal point to, to get those numbers. It just seems like it's, I hate to say this, it's a money grab now. Yeah, and it's ideology. Right. I think that's the other thing. I think you've talked about it. We don't need politics. And actually, the, the um, committee hearing yesterday um, kind of proved that. It's like, I mean... You know, if you don't agree with me, I'm going to leave you out of the meeting is what our right. top officials were doing. When, mm-hmm. You know, I mean, and Redfield, obviously, the head of the CDC says, I mean, all I was was the head of the CDC and they left <laughs> right. me out. I mean, it, it, se- it seems like seems like that's not science, uh, you know, bringing all uh, people of, of high, you know, at least Redfield should have been at the table. Maybe not. I mean, I don't think I should have. But what I mean right. is, you know, you would think he just with the job he had. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, yeah, it. It, it, to me, um, 
the vaccine itself, uh, vaccines uh, have a definite lobby. Uh, they also have, uh, they're one of the greatest profit makers for uh, pharmaceutical companies there is. Uh, because the liability, and really since Reagan signed it into law in 86, is limited. Meaning they, and here's another thing is, nothing better than a product that you give to everybody that's healthy. Um, <laughs> so, you know, that, that that's, and, and then governments pay for it. I mean, what no. I'm saying is you got you to gotta look at, you know, if, it's hard not to look at all that. Exactly. And so I'm not, I'm not saying that that's their intent, but when uh, the government and a big pharmaceutical company are on the same side, uh, I guess grab, grab your wallet. Yeah. Um, you uh, know, something. I mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Grab I, something. Yeah. And so I would, you know, that, that's just how I view it. I, I usually think, uh, you know, I'm, again, somebody who's a small businessman and believes in free enterprise, but a free enterprise isn't the government and uh, Congress and the executive uh, you know, all getting together and deciding this is what we're going to require everybody to do. Right. You know, obviously the other thing about the tennis player, I mean, he was hugging and holding uh, William and Kate's child. He must be so, I mean, yeah. how, how, what I mean is. <laughs> we're being silly. How do you limit him, but you got people pouring in the border? Oh, it, 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 I mean, it doesn't, uh, just from a. An, I, I think that's where we lose as public, there's, there's public no health. Sense, yeah. And I'm not a public health official, but the public health establishment, they by pushing so hard, they lose legitimacy. Right, correct. Because what you actually want people to do is you want people to come along, right? Not to force it. Because right. when you force it, they push. You back. get two kinds of people: people that push back and people that say there are, you know, these people are, cr you know, crazy or conspiracy. Yeah, up you to know? something. Yeah, yep. and I think, uh, you know, that's as the committee hearing yesterday kind of showed. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it makes you think. I mean, Redfield wasn't going to come out and say what were Fauci's intentions, but. I mean, just his actions kind of suggest something was uh, yeah. unclean there. Jordan Vaughn, our guest on this edition of Rick and Bubba University, the podcast. Go to medhelpclinics.com if you'd like to investigate maybe how they could help you. And thank you again for being on this edition of Rick and Bubba University, the podcast. <laughs>